Thanks. Uh, Leland joined us from um, Tableau, and before that, years of work in, in statistical land. He's quite a legend. His book, Grammar of Graphics, has been um, made into some uh, magnum opuses by several companies. We're fortunate to have him collaborate with us. He's one of my fastest hackers. Um, and um, his work on SPSS, of course, is legendary. It, uh, in automatic visualization, he brings um, one, of his, uh, one of his great works, I would say, hopefully one of his best. But uh, he's been enormous influence on the team and influencing um, not just the product, but the culture and the people and how we take this product to, to market. And, um, and, and more importantly, I'm quite excited to see the visualization as a culture, just it's in its infancy at H2O world, at H2O in, in, our, in our maker world. And, and I think it'll be fun to kind of take this work and give more feedback in space. Leland is uh, also uh, a proud parent of an uh, amazing mathematician. So his math runs in his, um, in his uh, circles. I'm quite fortunate to have him present out of his to the audience at H2O World. Thank you. Thanks, Sri. Ah. I probably shouldn't put it this way, but uh, in my 50 years of having worked in this field, uh, I have never worked for an organization, company, academic department with more brilliant people uh, than at H2O. And I'm saying that because um, I need to share the credit for Autoviz uh, with a number of people in the organization, uh, people like uh, Jan Gametz and uh, Alexi and Pasha and others. Uh, in any case, um, I think part of this is the result, I'll just briefly mention, Sri, that I've never met anyone who's put together strategically a group of people who are stimulated to have new ideas. And I think that's why you're seeing stuff like Patrick's work, which was, it, in my understanding, one of the first instances of machine learning interpretability, uh, which is now a, a hot topic. So let me talk about automatic visualization. I'm not gonna actually run the program today. I'm gonna run it tomorrow, because I wanna tell you what is the thinking behind this sort of uh, application. Why do we want to use it? Um, the first thing a lot of customers have reported is, well, that's very nice, but what do I do with this thing? And today I want to give you some ideas about what you do when you see unusual things going on. So I'm going to concentrate uh, in this talk on anomalies, because that's one of the big areas you have to worry about, especially if you're concerned with machine learning interpretability. If you don't care about whether your model is valid in the sense of having a certain set of criteria of meaningfulness, that's just fine. Uh, I wouldn't ask Kaglers, for example, to reduce their predictive power by taking into account some of these factors. They're in the business of trying to get the best prediction they possibly can uh, for a product, uh, problem, uh, at least in the classic Kaggle sense. So what I want to show you is uh, a number of these things are related to machine learning interpretability itself. But what we're looking at here is the problem of you've made a model. Now, is the model, are the assumptions of that model, before you do any interpretation at all, are the assumptions reasonable uh, if someone asked you, uh, how's it doing? So I'm going to talk about outliers, distributional anomalies, logical anomalies, model anomalies, and proxies. Now let's just say, uh, what is an anomaly, first of all? It's an observation, and I don't mean row in the data set. It's a very general thought. It's an observation we make that's inconsistent with our set of prior beliefs. That's kind of a Bayesian definition for it. Um, in this case, we have to ask, what kind of anomaly are you talking about? Well, you can, you can have outliers. And an outlier is an observation that's presumed generated by a probabilistic process in a vector space. Now, that's a technical definition. But it implies that uh, we are actually need a probability 
space on which to make or, or generate this degree of surprise. So all outliers are anomalies, but not all anomalies are outliers. A distribution anomaly, uh, anomaly is a distribution of data that doesn't fit conventional expectations. And by that, I mean you're running models or, uh, on a set of variables, and all of them have some sort of shape. And suddenly, one of those variables, or features, you might say, wide, wildly differs from the histogram, say, of all the others. And your, your suspicion should be aroused when that happened. Now, a logical anomaly is an observation inconsistent with the axioms of a system. In other words, there's certain required axioms uh, that you are building on, and you suddenly came across an instance that's inconsistent with that. Here's a, I'll show you later uh, a, uh, an example of this report that someone has been in a relationship with another person longer than he or she has been alive. Now, that's a logical anomaly. You don't need statistics or probability or anything to uh, be suspicious. Or finding that a certain car gets negative miles per gallon. Somebody's done a, a, a coding error probably in that case. Model anomalies are observations inconsistent with the model. Uh, that is to say, and this is technical, but don't worry about it. Uh, you fed uh, an observation with less than zero into a Poisson model or a Cox proportional hazards model or uh, residuals that clearly violate the assumptions for fitting a particular model. Finally, a proxy anomaly involves perfectly correlated variables. And these perfectly correlated variables can invalidate some models, not all. All right, outlier detection, let's start with that. Um, it has uh, a long-standing history. Um, the original goal, particularly among astronomers in the 18th century, was to reduce biases in their measurements. The astronomers began to suspect if they had one outlier and they were computing an average, then the outlier was going to pull the average over here and you were going to get uh, a biased estimate uh, from that average. Today, I believe the goal is to learn interesting stuff like uh, uh, you found an outrageous value for an income, uh, although I'm afraid that's prob probably extremely unlikely today, um, at least for incomes greater than zero. Uh, statisticians no longer delete outliers um, unless you absolutely know that it was a mistake, a coding mistake. Um, like in SPSS and in classical surveys, some of you are old enough to maybe remember this, missing value codes were coded with 999 on the punch cards, for example. You don't want to average that 999, which stands for missing, with all the other var values uh, below. Now, I'm just giving you three references. Uh, I personally think you're going to learn everything you need to know about outliers from those references. Um, or at least read them before you read anything in say, uh, a new, say, computer, recent computer science article or in statistics even, uh, if the people aren't aware of these issues in those books, um, that's not a good sign. All right, quickly, univer their univariate or multidimensional outliers are mostly uh, devised or predicated on two types of algorithms. One is the distance from the center of the rule. So that red point in the dot plot is way away from the average of all those other points, and we call it an outlier. The box plot on the left shows values that are far away from the median, not the mean. And that's probably, in many applications, a better way to do it, although I must say you will read in surveys, in ACM reviews, and other journals, Recommending box plots? No, don't do that. They're not, they weren't designed to identify outliers, and they don't actually work identifying outliers. So, but um, it, it was devised for a particular purpose on small data sets, and 
that's why, especially with big data, you can't use box plots for looking at outliers. Now, the second method is the gaps rule, which is any point that's far away from its nearest neighbor or nearest neighbors. You could ask for like k nearest neighbors, five neighbors, and average those and say it's far from those. Um, now, the beauty of these two rules is they generalize very nicely to the multidimensional context. Um, the distance from the center rule says that red point up there with the ellipse is far away from the centroid of that ellipse, and therefore it's an outlier. Far, by the way, is defined in this case in probabilistic terms through something called Mahalanobis distance. The great Indian statistician uh, who also was influential in politics in India uh, really uh, was the father of modern multivariate uh, uh, statistics. Anyway, the gaps rule works similarly. Those two points we would consider outliers if they are very far from their nearest neighbor and furthermore on some probability measure uh, that distance actually maps to a very small probability. Now I just want to quickly point out um, every year I go to a visualization conference uh, and I'm on uh, uh, like some people in this audience, I'm on the program committee where you get papers in and you read them and you have to review them. And I am stunned by how many times visualization people think visualization is a good way to detect outliers. It is not and it will not work <laughs> despite repeated assertions to the contrary. Here's an example. The two red points by a Mahalanobis test based on a chi-square um, because I generated, incidentally, those points from a joint normal, a bivariate normal distribution. So the Malanobis test uh, based on chi-square is valid for that case and those really are outliers. And look, move over to the right for either point or up to the top and they're in the middle of those histograms. So in a multivariate situation, those are outliers, but we couldn't find them if we looked at a lot of histograms and, uh, and tried to find points that are far away. I won't go too far into the right-hand plot except to say those red points are lying somewhere in the middle of that space uh, encapsulated by that frame and they are outliers also. But they don't look like outliers on each of those marginal projections. Now what's worse, Parallel coordinates, and some of you have seen these things, are an absolute favorite among visualization people. They have their uses, but one of them is not outlier detection because look at those two red uh, profiles. Those um, are outliers by a statistical multivariate outlier test, and yet they lie kind of in the middle of all the other mess. So you can't expect an outlier to be way off at the edge of a parallel coordinate plot. It doesn't work that way. And finally, multivariate algorithms, I mean uh, machine learning algorithms are okay and some of them are very powerful like the local outlier factor program uh, is very good. It doesn't scale very well but it is quite good at multidimensional outliers. The only problem is how do you no. <laughs> It'll give you a rank of all the things that are most likely to be outliers, but there's no probability or risk associated with making such a judgment. So I, I grabbed this from a website that was explaining local outlier factors, and the writer said, look, I ran this thing, I think using R or whatever, and those red points are outliers. Well, in fact, they are not. The sample size is too small to make any statement about it. And that's the one thing you know from elementary statistics. Don't infer too much based on small samples. All right. Now, outliers can bias predictions. We know this in intro stat if you take a course in regression, that they really can do a lot of harm, uh, particularly in least squares algorithms. Now, what I did here was generate three Gaussian, that is to say, normal zero, one variables, x, y, z. I went to predict z from x and y, and fortunately, that prediction surface is pretty much flat. 
In other words, there's really no good prediction. Now, I ran uh, an older version, not that old, of DAI on this, and it gets just what you would expect. That is the standard error of the estimate, which in fact is root mean square error. They're both the same formula, is one. That's because the standard deviation of a normal variable is one. So now let's add an outlier. See that little point over there? That's one point. See the spot over there to the left? That's 999 points, all in that tiny little area. The same points, by the way, that were in the other plot. Now what? We run it again, and the root mean square error is 94. So something's going on. That outlier is really hurting uh, our estimate. Now, we can either take care of it, or there are other methods, by the way, that you can use that do not involve deleting the outliers. Um, so let's look at some of those. We, uh, this is the summary. Regression methods, like ordinary least squares, generalized linear models, and so on, are susceptible to outliers. We just saw that. So the workarounds are delete the outliers. And that's not a great idea unless you actually look at them and you say, whoa, that's the 999 or some weird value that can, a key punch error, we used to call it. Or better yet, use regressed, robust regression, like median regression, and you can do similar things with tree-based methods. The people will say tree methods are robust, and they say, look, I, you know, outliers will not affect a tree-based method. They are wrong. You'll see that advice all over the internet, and they are wrong. Uh, it's quite easy to construct some simple examples where you can see that an outlier ruins a tree-based estimate. Now, they are right in the sense that if you have outliers on each separate, uh, that's, I jumped one, but let me just finish with that thought. Trees on data with univariate predictor outliers are usually not going to hurt a tree estimate. However, uh, regression trees on data having dependent variable univariate outliers are susceptible. Classification trees, not so much. Uh, for one thing, they're dealing with categories. But regression trees, like CART and even random forests based on a CART model, uh, are susceptible to outliers. So we have to worry about an outlier in a dependent variable. Now, trees on data with multivariate outliers are usually susceptible. So it's very nice to have a test of multivariate outliers before you do any modeling, and that's what AutoViz does when you get all those little thumbnails that I'll show you tomorrow, two of those graphs color points or profiles red the way you saw in the parallel coordinate plot if the test for multivariate outliers is significant. By the way, random forests and gradient boosting, boosted machines, you know, those types of trees, are not exceptions to these rules. Again, the work, uh, workarounds for this is delete the outliers. Well, you might do that if you say, I know why that was an outlier, which is a great, great thing. Uh, but if you delete them without having any idea why it's an outlier, not so good. For one thing, they probably are going to show up in your test data set uh, or in your scoring data later. Or you can use robust loss functions and uh, Driverless has some options for doing those things. Now, distribution anomalies. Um, most classical statistic prediction methods assume normal distributions. If you have an intro stack course, you're going to learn that. Some statistical prediction models are not based on norm uh, normal distributions, and that's why, where we get uh, generalized linear models, for example, where we deal with other kinds of uh, distributions. And we see this in logistic regression, Poisson, negative binomial, blah, blah, blah. Skewed distributions, and this goes back to John Tukey and even before Tukey, if you can transform, let's say all your data are positive or actually uh, non, uh, they're uh, excluding zeros, you could take, say, the log of those data. Uh, and probably pull everything around so at least it looks pretty symmetric, then you could use regular methods. Here's an example. These are body weights and brain weights. 
from a study of sleep in mammals, and it's crying out for being logged. Uh, on the left are the raw data, and on the right, look what happens when we log the weights. Just a beautiful, uh, evidently linear relationship. Again, look at the difference there. The line on the left for the raw data um, is just not appropriate. On the right, it does very well, and look, at R squared, improve quite a bit. Now, here's the interesting thing. For decision trees, the raw data does only almost half as well as the log data values. Now, this is just a slide with a summary of Tukey's ladder of powers, because sometimes you don't want to log, you may want to square root the values. And uh, th this transformation, x goes to x to the p power, where p is a parameter. If p is 2, that's x goes to x squared. That's not widely needed, but... And p is 1 is the identity transformation. p is 0.5 is the square root, and the inter interesting thing about Tukey's ladder is that p equals 0 you can't actually enter that into the computer program. When you hit exact zero, substitute log of x. And that is evident in the Box-Cox transformation. By the way, everyone credits Box and Cox for the Box-Cox transformation, but if you read the original article, it was Tukey's idea. And they just reparameterized it so they could fix the log of x problem and make it work nicely for geometrics. Now, here is a an example of that graph I told you about. You look at that scatter plot, and what do you think? That doesn't look like scatter plots you normally see, does it? It's like a triangle. It is not a random statistical distribution from any of the known ones. It's an implication. In other words, if your age is comparable to the years in your current relationship, then you're on that diagonal line. And of course, normally, it would be less than that. You don't get married until you're, well, I better not say. Um, all right. Now, logical analyses, how do we deal with them? I haven't got much to tell you on that. Look at the graph, at the plot, and you say, oh my god. Uh, in fact, you may look at a bunch of plots and say, that's weird. And you apply Berkson's intraocular traumatic test, boom. It hit me between the eyes. It's obviously weird, right? Bergson, by the way, is the inventor of logistic regression, interestingly. Uh, and I learned some of that because his nephew, I think, was in the department I was in at UIC, uh, Josh Bergson. Anyway, uh, or you can, and I'm sure some of you have done this, you develop, when you filter your data and you do feature engineering, you write an algorithm to trap things like negative age or negative counts or so on. All right, I'm going to finish up with model anomalies. These are things that show up after you fit a model. So they're very similar to the kinds of analyses Patrick's involved with in machine learning interpretability. Now here's something I'm, I'm giving you. You almost never see anyone write about these residual plots for other machine learning models, but they're perfectly valid. On the left is the standard linear model on the data set, and it's, uh, these are the residuals. So things above that red line are being underpredicted, and things below that line are being overpredicted, and clearly it's a mess. So I fit a nonlinear exponential model to the data, and things are a little better. But then I fit uh, a tree model to the data, and it's looking pretty nice. So you look at the tree model residual plot, and that tells you, you know, maybe I could get a, a decent fit with some other method, but that tree model looks like the one I should go with. Now, what do we do when we look at these residual plots? This is not a residual plot. Here's someone asking a question on Stack Overflow who doesn't understand a 125-year-old statistical, it's the most famous artifact in all of statistics or concept, and that's called regression toward the mean, discovered by uh, Galton in 1886. The problem is that plot, and by the way, we do that plot, uh, but you just have to know how to interpret it. 
And the idea is, if you had a perfect fit in your data, it would fall along that diagonal line. If it doesn't, people will tell you, well, it just strays and you get fuzz along that. That's not quite true. This is what happens when it doesn't. It starts to tilt. And why does it do that? Well, here's another juicy one I found on Stack Overflow. Someone complains that Excel is fitting the not the best fitting line. And this person fundamentally misunderstands, again, Galton's regression to the mean. The person thinks that red line's a better fit to the data. But the black line is the fit of finding the best predictive value for a given x. And if you look above and below that black line, it's pretty even. And that line is telling you where you ought to place your bet. It's simply a matter of the definition of what you're doing when you fit regressions. So when you turn around and do the residual plot on this plot here, this is what you get. It looks perfectly good. It just means the prediction's not that good, but that's what a good residual plot ought to look like. Now, I'm just going to flash through some of these residual plots for different AI models and take a look at how beautifully they behave. Um, this is the Kaggle Rossman Stores data set. We're trying to predict sales for these stores. And I, we've colored a subset of the stores as to whether they were open or closed, because if they're closed, they have zero sales at that particular time point. So here's a generalized linear model. Here is a deep learning model. And notice over there on the left, those closed stores aren't modeled all that well. And there's actually a trend. They're going down versus the predictive models. That's not a good thing. Here's a gradient boosting method, like XGBoost or like GBM. Um, it does quite well. In this one instance, however, a distributed random forest has almost all those red things right on zero. It's getting it just right. Now, let me point out one thing that's so important about these residual models, um, and that is, notice the predictions are getting worse out at the right end of the thing. So if you want to get a very confident prediction, uh, that's great if you're at the left end, but you see how those are spreading out? That's called heteroscedastic uh, residual variance, by the way. It doesn't matter, but, but the point is to notice that it's not even, and you're not going to see this by looking at a mean square error, say. Now, I'll just point out, it's very nice to add a non-parametric smoother to your residual plot to see something like this, which is to say, the predictions are not following the, the, the rule for fitting these kinds of models. The rule being that model, that line should be relatively horizontal. So again, it's not biased in any direction. Now just notice, and I'm pointing out something a lot of people have seen before, Frank Anscombe was a magnificent statistician at Yale who, um, who was very concerned with, he was one of the early, along with Tukey, data an analysts. And he constructed this little toy data set to show you, look, all the correlations are the same. So you could model these things, not look at the residuals and say, wow, I got a really nice correlation. And in fact, which one is the one you want to pick? Um, so look, there's one number, root mean squared error, or the standard error of the estimate is sy.x, and that's the formula. Well, in statistics, never, never, and in machine learning, never, never, sorry, never trust a single number. The story is a big story, and it can't be summarized by one number. So I'm saying always look at residual plots, whether it's automatic or manual. And statistics are great. That's what we use them for, is to en enhance and ground our decisions. But make sure you look at visualizations alongside them. And I'm just summarizing what I already told you about how you look at residuals. And what do you do if they don't look good? Well, start hunting around for other variables. They might not even be in your original data set. If you're not a Kagler, um, you won't be accused of leakage in your particular application. So I'm not advising you to go hunt, hunt around for another variable if it's not in that 
that particular data set. All right, last concept. I'm sorry, I think I am going off over time a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Proxy variables are substitutes, and economists know this very well. Uh, carrying a purse is a proxy for gender. Uh, actually, that was true only up until the era of <laughs> metrosexuals, but whatever. Uh, body mass index is a proxy for weight. It's not exactly a measure of weight. And proxy anomalies are collections of variables now, uh, that are highly correlated. Now, this is what you've got to watch out for. It's not well understood, again, by machine learning people. Uh, bias doesn't mean you have a, a proxy for, say, age, race, sex, whatever, one of those protected classes. Doesn't mean you have one of those in your model. Nothing wrong with that. You can put gender in a, as one of your predictors, and the model can can actually make predictions that are totally uncorrelated with gender. It's the weirdest thing, but uh, it's true <laughs> mathematically. So that's not what we want to try to do with our models. We want to correlate the predictions with gender and see if it correlates. And if it does, you're in a heap of trouble, right? And you want to go, uh, especially if you're in a bank, uh, do something about it. All right. Lastly, the weird thing you can add variables that have nothing to do with gender, put them in a model, and suddenly the combination of those variables perfectly, almost perfectly predicts gender. Again, be careful. So, uh, by the way, most of us know, I think, you can't put two perfectly correlated variables in an ordinary least squares regression. It just won't compute. Uh, there are ways around the problem, but you don't want to do it. And in fact, multicollinearity in general uh, is not a great thing in models. Now, I'm not going to read this whole slide, and I, I know full well you shouldn't do slides like this to an audience. Let me just tell you essentially what they're saying, and these are the XGBoost people saying it, and they say it quite correctly, that um, this issue I told you about with proxies depends on the model. So, Random forests don't do so well in this issue. Gradient boosting machines do better. And lastly, here's just an ordinary way uh, of thinking about that problem. And I took it out of a paper of Kahneman and Tversky's. You know, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize recently, along with Tversky, who died tragically, but whatever. The essence of it is, would you pay for information to place a bet that perfectly correlates with what you already know? Of course not. It wouldn't help you in the slightest in making your bet. So think about that when you look at visualizations, um, because in AutoViz tomorrow, you'll see, right, one of the first things it looks at is, uh-oh, these two variables are almost perfectly correlated. So I'm, I'm sorry, that was a little longer than I expected, but I wanted you to see what's behind this idea of visualization. It's not an ornament, you know, it's not eye candy. What's important about visualization is the model and the math behind the visualization. It's just a way of representing mathematical and statistical ideas. So thanks. <laughs>